I'm going to talk about it from A to Z, basically. Uh -oh. Oh, there we go. Okay, so first thing I'm going to talk about is um, the anatomy about the, of the knee. Then we're going to talk about some pathology, and then we'll talk about how we diagnose and treat problems about the knee. Okay, so first thing we're going to talk a little bit about is anatomy. Ligaments in the knee, there are uh, multiple ligaments uh, in the knee that act as check reins on the extremes of motion. So they let you go so far, and then the ligaments will stop your motion. The articular cartilage is the smooth gliding surface, like the shiny tissue at the end of a chicken bone. Uh, and that actually acts as like the gliding surface in your knee joint. Menisci, meniscus for singular, menisci for plural, is a fibrocartilaginous or rubbery extension of the tibia or the leg bone. They basically deepen the knee and they also act as shock absorbers. And then we can also diagnose problems with those menisci based on where the, tear, where, where the pain is in the knee, whether on the inside or the outside of the knee. Okay, so let's talk about the ligaments. Ligaments are aligned, are, are, are very, very fibrous tissues and they're aligned longitudinally in the length of the where they pull. So for example, if something is trying to prevent your one leg bone from moving forward on the other, those fibers will be or oriented in that direction. And again, they limit the extremes of translation or movement, rotation, and range of motion of the, of the body parts. In this place, the case of the knee, you can see a bunch of ligaments marked here with uh, red dots. I see at least, at least six here that are marked. So let's talk about the articular or surface cartilage of the knee. Chondrocytes are the cells, chondro means cartilage, sites means cell, are the cells that make the matrix or the tissue of the cartilage. It's very much a water-based um, structure and it has multiple different layers where the cartilage cells live and they make the extracellular matrix and they make a very gliding surface. The uh, cartilage surface in your knee has essentially the same gliding or smoothness as ice as an ice skating rink. So it's very smooth and allows for a really good gliding, which is what we want when we have two bearing surfaces on each other. Unfortunately, it has a very poor healing ability, which we'll talk about a little later when we talk about some of the pathology and the treatment options for cartilage injuries. The menisci or meniscus is, a, is essentially like a radial tire. It has longitudinal fibers that allow for shock absorption. And some of the fibers are oriented vertically or horizontally to give cross fiber, almost like your um, the radial tire that has multiple cross-linking ch uh, chains of steel or belts of steel that go along with the radial tire. There's also cartilage cells in there called chondrocytes and they make the extracellular matrix or they make the proteins that make these fibers. And the meniscus in general has a very poor healing ability. And we'll talk about that again a little later when we get to the uh, diagnosis and treatment of problems in the knee. So when I see a patient, I know everybody's been on the one side as the patient, but when we're physicians and we're looking at patients and they come in the office, we really wanna ask, ask a bunch of pointed questions to try to get to the bottom, bottom of their problem. So we wanna ask them about their history. We wanna ask how long it's been bothering them? Has it been a day? Has it been a year? Uh, we wanna ask them, is there a trauma? Did they have a twist or a fall or a slip or a misstep? Was it atraumatic? Did they just start hurting one day out of the blue? We wanna know where the, where the pain is coming from, if there's been any swelling in the knee, and if they're having any mechanical symptoms such as buckling, locking, or giving way of the knee. And if it's a sports injury, we wanna know if there was a twisting injury, if there was a fall, or if there was a direct blow to their knee. After I've gotten a good thorough history, I wanna take a look at the knee. Is it swollen? Is there bruising? Is it not lined up properly compared to the other knee? We want to push around the knee and see where it hurts. Does it hurt on the inside of the knee? Does it hurt on the outside of the knee? Does it hurt in the front or back of the knee? We want to test uh, for the ligamentous stability. So we want to do uh, testing about in, moving the knee in and out, as well as front and back to see if the ligaments have been injured. And again, those ligaments act as check grains. So we want to see if there's any ex, uh, abnormal movement or excursion of the knee um, on one side and we compare it to the other knee. And then we want to do some testing of the menisci to see like we're doing here on the bottom right to see if there's any meniscus pathology. So we always wanna get x-rays. So in the office, we have the ability to x-ray patients. We always wanna start with x-rays to make sure there's nothing bony wrong. Is there a broken bone? Is there a um, arthritic process going on? And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, we can see all these things from x-ray. However, sometimes we do need secondary tests such as MRI or CAT scans. MRI is very good for seeing soft tissue pathology such as um, meniscus tears, ligament tears, 
tendon tears. Uh, but again, we want to use the MRI and our history to correlate everything together. CAT CT scans are very good for fractures. Uh, we don't order them as often as we do MRIs and x-rays. So let's talk a little bit about technology. First technology is called the arthro arthroscope or arthroscopy is the technique. It's a fiber optic camera hooked up to a lens. And we pass these instruments, they're very small, they're about four millimeters in diameter, which is about an eighth of an inch in diameter or less. And we pass those through small little incisions in the, in the joints, especially in the knee. And these can decrease problems with surgical incisions. And we can also do most of our surgeries in this minimally invasive technique and way. Let's talk about MRI or magnetic resonance imaging. It's a rapidly developing field. Every year the imaging gets better. So essentially what it does, it takes a big magnet and it excites the hydrogen atoms in your body. And then depending on how those hydrogen atoms are oriented and how much of them there are, the tissue has different density on the MRI. And we can slice the patient in different directions. Here's a coronal or front view like a crown. This is an axis view or, or looking straight down from above. And so we have different, different axes of cuts so we can see different structures. And again, as I always tell all my patients, we have to correlate the MRI with the history and physical examination. And we're always treating the patient, not the MRI. The MRI has oftentimes have a lot of abnormalities. They don't always correlate with what's wrong with the patient. Okay, so let's talk a little about some pathology and how we treat these things in the knee. Okay, ligament injuries. They occur usually via twisting or abnormal loading of the knee. Most ligament injuries can be treated non-surgery, surgically. However, surgery is a very important adjunct in our treatment regimen. So again, we wanna get the history. When somebody tears a ligament, there usually is a very distinct history that goes along with that ligament injury. Whether it's a twisting injury in a non-contact situation in sports, whether they got hit from the inside or the outside of their knee, those involve different ligaments. So first thing we wanna do, we wanna look at the knee. Is it swollen? Is there bruising? Is it malaligned in some way? We wanna check the range of motion. Is, this, is there swelling in the knee that's preventing the knee from moving from range of motion? Then I would suggest getting, doing draining and getting the fluid out of the knee so we can get a better exam. There are provocative tests like we're doing right here. This is called a Lachman test named after Dr. Lachman. And that's testing for ACL deficiency. Very sensitive and specific test. Uh, we wanna get x-rays to make sure there's no fractures. And then sometimes we'll get an MRI to confirm a ligament injury as well as look for other pathologies such as meniscus tears. So cruciate ligament injuries, those are the crossing ligaments in the middle of your knee. There's two of them, the anterior cruciate ligament, which anybody who follows sports will know what that is. And then the posterior cruciate ligament, which is much less commonly injured ligament because it's about twice the size of the ACL and doesn't get injured as often. So PCL tears sometimes need surgery if they're complete tears, but usually we can treat them non-operatively. And the ACL rule is the rule of thirds is one third of people will likely need surgery, one third might need surgery, and one third probably don't need surgery. It's really patient dependent. We have people who are copers and that or people have recurrent instability. If people have recurrent instability of their knee, then we would consider doing surgery to fix that ACL. And then collateral ligaments are the side ligaments in the knee on the inside and the outside of the knee are usually treated non-operatively typically with a brace for about four to eight weeks. Okay, so let's talk about the anterior cruciate ligament, the ACL. Unfortunately, it does not heal. So therefore as surgeons, we have to make a new ligament whether we take it from you or we take it from a donor. My oldest ACL reconstruction patient is 62 years old and she did fantastic. We used a cadaver graft on her knee. So we either take auto graft, which means a ligament, a graft of, of some kind of tendon from you and there's multiple different options. Or we take it from a donor, a, de, uh, a deceased donor. There are low, very, it is very low risk, but it's not zero risk. And we have to talk about that risk with the patient, but these are extremely low risk grafts. This is, happens to be a graft um, from the ankle that we use very commonly in ACL reconstruction. So this is, this, is the, this is a surgery. So what we have to do for the ACL is we have to make sockets in the, in the bones, in the femur, in the thigh bone, in the tibia, in the leg bone. Then we have to pass our, lig our graft across there and fix it and hold it in place with little screws and washers and that's how we may do an ACL. So this is what an ACL looks like. Like, hold on, let's mute that. These are the tunnels we make in the femur and the tunnel in the tibia. And then we take our graph and we pass it across those tunnels. And this is what our graph looks like here after we fixate it in place. Nice tension and that's recreating an ACL. And then that body, your body 
we'll take that graft and make a new ligament out of it. We also will address um, meniscus tears, which often which occur in about 75% of ACL tears. So we want to have a return to sport. Usually it's about five to 12 months, usually closer to seven or eight months. We don't want any cutting activities earlier than seven or eight months because that's what puts our ACL at risk. And then we want to address the other injuries and that is really important in getting a good full recovery. Okay, so let's talk about articular cartilage. That's that gliding surface we talked about that's like an ice skating rink. So you can have acute or chronic injuries. So I like to differentiate my patients between a pothole or like this one here and a bad road, which is really more of an arthritis picture. So a pothole we can address surgically with some kind of cartilage procedure. A bad road usually needs resurfacing because there's too many potholes and that's where Dr. Saxena is gonna take over from there. So our diagnosis, we wanna look at our exam. We wanna look at x-rays because sometimes we can see the actual cartilage injury on an x-ray and an MRI. And sometimes these are often missed even on MRI studies and then we don't, don't pick them up until we get in there for surgery. So they can be traumatic. And I'm gonna show you an example of a traumatic one in a second. They can be atraumatic where the bone, actually there's loss of blood supply to the bone and the bone basically dies behind the cartilage and the cartilage becomes unstable. That's called osteochondritis dissecans or dried out cartilage and bone. So treatment, they don't all need surgery. Sometimes they can be treated with activity modification, but sometimes we can go in there and actually put the piece of cartilage and bone back in place. Sometimes we have to take the piece out and we do what's called microfracture. We make little holes in the bone to get bone marrow to come out to fill a pothole or we um, perform cartilage grafting. And I'll show you that next. So here's an example of a case of a patient who's a 37 year old male who was doing CrossFit. He was doing what's called a super squat, which is basically where you take your your tailbone and put it down to your heels. And you do that very aggressively and typically with weight. And it's a really deep bend. And after he did one of those, he had a lot of pain over the inside part of his knee. His x-rays are normal. So my thinking was he probably had a torn meniscus cartilage from the deep bending injury of the knee. But when I got his MRI, he had this cartilage defect right here on the femur that, uh, that, didn't, that I wasn't expecting. So typically the meniscus tear is much more common than this type of injury. So this is what his surgery looked like, his arthroscopy looked like. So he had an acute medial femoral condyle cartilage injury. And our choices were to clean it up, microfracture, do a cartilage graft. He's a very active guy. So we decided to do a cartilage graft. And this is what the cartilage defect looks like. So you can see the defect right here. Normal cartilage is the white shiny gliding surface. And then the pothole is right here. So what I did is we took, here's the pothole again, looking macroscopically at surgery. And we did, we took a cartilage donor, a dowel plug of about um, of, of 20 by 10 millimeter cartilage and bone graft and plugged it into the knee. And that, re that reconstructed his knee and he did really well with this. So this is a long recovery. These cartilage grafts take a long time to incorporate. You gotta be non-weight bearing for at least one to two months. And then out the, the uh, success rate is about 80%. So it's not 100%, but it's not zero. So 80% is pretty good. We're taking cartilage from a donor and sticking it to somebody else's knee. And as far as return to sports, really unknown as far as what percentage of these patients return to sport. And that procedure is usually reserved for people under the age of 50. So osteoarthritis, I'm not gonna to get too far into this because this is Dr. Saxena's realm. Uh, it's a wear and tear problem. It's a breakdown of the cartilage again, the bad road surface. It's a self-perpetuating process. The more inflammation there is, the more breakdown of the cartilage there is. So X-ray is very key. You can see here, we have nice clear space between the bones on this side, but on the other side, there's almost no clear space. That means the cartilage has been worn down like this. So what are the non-replacement treatments for surgical treatments for osteoarthritis? Arthroscopy is really kind of not the best option. Sometimes we will use it in conjunction with the torn meniscus cartilage, but we really try to re reserve that uh, for really limited indications. There is a procedure called a realignment osteotomy or tibial osteotomy or femoral osteotomy where we can actually cut the bone like so, and then we can move the bone this way so that the weight-bearing weight surface is more through the outside or good part of the knee versus the inside or bad part of the knee. So the femoral ones are very uncommon. Most people are bow-legged with their arthritis. So we do a tibial-sided cut here and realign it. This is what it looks like right here. This is the bone. We use hardware to hold this in place. We put bone graft in to basically wedge the tibia open to make the weight-bearing surface more through the, the um, outside part of the knee instead of the inside part of the knee, which is typically more osteoarthritic. 
It's a long recovery, about six months. And usually we can get about eight to 10 years out of this procedure before somebody may ultimately need a knee replacement. So let's talk about meniscus tears. Most common injury that we take care of in sports medicine. There can be degenerative tears or acute tears. There's different, different patterns. There's radial tears, horizontal tears. These tend to be more degenerative as well as a flap tear. These longitudinal tears are, are much more common uh, in the younger population. Those oftentimes can be repaired. So complex tears, which means the tears in multiple different, pa different um, patterns uh, are found in older patients and longitudinal tears are found in younger patients, which means under the age of 30. So the clinical examination uses pain along the joint line between the tibia and the femur. There can be associated a twisting injury or there can be chronic pain without, without an injury such as degenerative tears. And again, pain over the medial joint line and swelling are the most common findings. There's also a procedure called the McMurray's test where we flex and rotate the knee and kind of catch that meniscus between the two bones. And that's a very sensitive test for meniscus tears. We wanna get x-rays to make sure there's not a lot of arthritis. And the MRI is about 93% accurate. So we do get people who have meniscus tears that we don't pick them up about 7% of the time. At that point, we have to make a decision whether we're gonna be going in there surgically or we're gonna to try to treat, treat non-surgically. So what do we, how do we decide if we're gonna repair or remove the meniscus? That is a tricky one. Um, it's usually based on age more than anything. We wanna look at the patient's activity level and we wanna see where the tear is. So the blood supply for the meniscus comes from the outside and moves its way in. So the blood, so if the meniscus tear is out here, we can certainly consider doing a repair, stitching it back together. If it's way out over in here where there's no blood supply, no blood supply means no healing, no healing means we're not gonna do a repair. So we're just gonna basically take the meniscus, part of the meniscus out. We usually have taking about 15 to 20% of the meniscus out. This is the most common procedure done in orthopedic surgery is a partial meniscectomy. Um, the recovery for meniscus repair is about, about um, three to four months and, re and a non-weight bearing period for about one month. So it's a longer recovery, uh, but if we can get this to heal, then you'll be whole. And again, usually we're doing repairs under the age of 40. So this is what a partial meniscectomy looks like. Where we've trimmed out, this one actually has a little arthritis too, but we trim out the torn flap and meniscus and we get a nice smooth border here. And uh, there is a risk for arthritis down the road, unfortunately. Uh, and it again is the most common orthopedic surgery, surgery by a lot. So recovery from a repair of the meniscus is about three to four months to return to normal activities versus a partial meniscectomy is only about four to eight weeks. And the, we, we ask, what's the risk for arthritis? Well, about 30% of people at 30 years out from a partial meniscectomy will have symptoms of arthritis that require treatment. That doesn't mean that there's not more people who have arthritis, it just means about 30% of them will actually require treatment for this. All right, let's talk about some overuse problems. Patellar tendinitis and quadriceps tendinitis you can get very commonly. They're overuse injuries from running, jumping, squatting, kneeling. Iliotibia band tendinitis, the iliotibia band is run at, or IT band runs right out here. It's very commonly known as a runner's knee. As the patient, as the person runs, that IT band runs over the outside of the femur and can get irritated. There's a little bursa sac that sits underneath it can get irritated. And these are very rarely operated on. Usually it's active modification, physical therapy, home exercise program, anti-inflammatory such as Motrin, Advil, Leave, or prescription strength medication. Once in a while, we'll do injections as well, but most of the time, this will work, get better with stretching and patience and time. Okay, let's talk about patellofemoral or kneecap disorders. Again, very common. What happens is, is the cartilage, which should be again, nice and white and shiny. You can see all this crab meat type material uh, hanging down here. This shouldn't be happening. So this is breakdown of the cartilage. It's a very common problem. It can be traumatic or atraumatic. Uh, it's a problem that we treat most globally non-surgically. Um, we try medication injections. However, some people, younger patients under 25 will have, um, will have, can have patella dislocations where the kneecap will jump out of its little groove that sits in and tear the tissue that holds it in place. This is usually uh, a combination of a quadriceps or muscle contraction with a slightly bent knee and the kneecap will jump out the tracks. And what happens is you can tear the tissue that holds it in place. Kneecap, the patellofemoral joint is, a, is very much like a seal balancing a ball on its nose. It's a very un, inherently unstable joint and one trauma can set it off in the wrong direction. So how do we treat this? Not everybody needs surgery. We oftentimes will treat these non-operatively in a brace like so that has a little speed bump on the outside 
that prevents people from having their kneecap jump out of the tracks. Um, it's about a 50% recurrent rate. So it's pretty high, but not 90% like some other areas in the body. So if we decide to do surgery for this, there's multiple options. This is my go-to procedure now. It's called a medial patellofemoral ligament reconstruction. So we're reconstructing the tissue that was torn with a graft. There's also procedures to realign the, the tibia, um, which is a, is a much bigger procedure, which we do much less frequently these days. So let's talk about some emerging technologies. There are tissue replacement, such we talked about earlier with the ACL with allografts. And there's also bioengineered tissues where we can get something like this, which is a hydrated sheet of cartilage cells that we can actually impregnate or implant in somebody's joint. There's bio, bio, bone graft substitutes such that, are, that conduct bone that we can actually put into the body and that will help form, make grow, bone grow around fractures. Uh, there's biological cement such as this one here. We can actually, it's almost like a paste or a putty that we can backfill into a fracture or into an area of defect and it will harden up and the body will use that to grow bone into. There are scaffolds that can be utilized, uh, biological scaffolds that we use to make new, men new menisci and new ligaments. And there's also PRP or platelet-rich plasma, which is a blood spinning procedure where we can take that material and um, inject it into a joint or into a tendon and try to jumpstart somebody's biological healing process. There's also stem cells which are still questioned where, where their best use is. But um, right now their kind of best use is in, in uh, tendon healing, but they're still somewhat controversial as far as the cost is concerned. And there's bone marrow aspirate, which is kind of a derivative of stem cells, which does have some use again in, in ligament and meniscus and, uh, and tendon growth and healing. So in conclusion, the knee is a very complex joint as you can see from some of our pictures. It has multiple supporting structures, which means a lot of layers of injury potential. Both surgery and non-surgical treatments are very important. So how are we doing as far as fixing knees? Uh, they improve, and we're improving with our technology as we get better at doing things and better with the anatomy. Anatomy never changes. And improving the understanding of how to rehabilitate these joints after surgery. And also we have to have reasonable goals for, of treatment. The future is gonna hold better imaging, and also the biological enhancement is kind of where things are going, like I just showed you on the previous slide, especially with these hematologic and scaffolding um, materials are really gonna make a big game, be a big game changer as far as getting things to heal better, more efficiently and stronger. So that's my talk, thank you very much. These are my kids and my wife. Okay, Any, uh, are we gonna take questions now? Or are we gonna do it, we'll do it at the end. I think we can do it at the end. Perfect, okay, I will. Okay. All right, so I'm going to, um, next is Dr. Saxena, and I'm just gonna give you a little information on Dr. Saxena. Dr. Saxena is a fellowship trained board certified orthopedic surgeon specializing in primary and revision hip and knee arthro arthroplasty. A Bucks County native, Dr. Saxena enrolled in the prestigious accelerated medical program at Pennsylvania State University for undergrad and Thomas Jefferson Medical College for medical school. He trained in orthopedic surgery at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital and completed specialized training in adult reconstruction at the Anderson Orthopedic Clinic in Virginia. Dr. Saxena serves as an editor for numerous orthopedic journals and is a member of multiple orthopedic social community. His primary focus is on patient education and outcomes. With a team approach involving the patient and their support system, as well as physical therapists and nurse navigators, he tailors a specific treatment plan for each patient. Okay, Dr. Cecilia, welcome, and you can start whenever. Thanks so much, Maggie, and thanks to Marsha Rudolph and the rest of the team at Capital for putting this on. Um, I hope that you know, the, the community members and, and patients that are here this evening uh, learn, you know, a little more about their need and understanding, and hopefully, you know, it, it's, I find it always difficult um, for, for patients from their perspective. You know, you have only, you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes with a doctor, so you know, to get your questions in order and to understand fully what's going on, whether it's orthopedics, whether it's cardiology, the better baseline of knowledge that you have, the better opportunity you'll have to understand and, and then make the right decision for you. So I'm really glad everyone's here. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you. And uh, thanks to my partner, partner, um, Dr. Hornstein. Um, that was a very informative talk. And to be honest, uh, Dr. Hornstein, you've made my job kind of easy because you've taught the patients here all about the anatomy of the knee. And, you know, Josh is the person who takes care of your knee when you're 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or maybe even 60 years old. Um, and then my field, joint replacement, comes in as you get older, uh, 
uh, whether it's 40s or 50s or 60s or, or beyond. Um, so let's get started. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the knee and you've kind of already learned how it works and why it might hurt. Dr. Hornstein's giving you a lot of that. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about knee replacements and, and options that patients have. Um, so just to recap, you have you know four bones that really make up the knee joint. It's the thigh bone or the femur, uh, the shin bone or the tibia, tibia. The fibula is out here, which isn't really part of the joint. And then the kneecap or the patella. Uh, and then there's the cartilage in between all these bones. So how do people develop arthritis? And you can basically develop arthritis a few ways. Um, you can have abnormal anatomy, um, like maybe a post-traumatic deformity, like you had a fracture at a younger age. Um, you can have abnormal biology. You could uh, have a condition known as avascular necrosis, where the blood supply to the uh, joint surface dies, so the cartilage dies. Um, you can get overuse injuries, just whether it be like a tendonitis injury, or, uh, or, you know, long-term, you know, runners, things like that, uh, where the knee basically just breaks down over time. It's almost like, you know, the shocks or struts on a car where, you know, at five years, they're okay. At 10 years, a little worse. At 20 years, they're even worse. Um, and then there's also genetics. We hear a lot of patients tell us that, you know, my brother had a knee replacement or my mom had a knee replacement. And so um, those patients often end up presenting with arthritis as well. So the best way I can liken arthritis is to a door hinge. So we take this brand new door hinge. It's a normal functioning joint. It's basically similar to healthy cartilage. It's well lubricated. It's got full motion and it's pain free. And then, you know, we live our lives and we have normal function that we take for granted, whether it's walking, getting in and out of a car, exercising, just in general, enjoying life. And then all of a sudden we wake up one day and we have this for our joint. This is a rusty door hinge, okay? It's like an osteoarthritic joint. It's damaged cartilage. The lubricating mechanism isn't there. There's a loss of motion and there's pain. It creaks and it cracks. And so when we're talking about arthritis, uh, I feel like that's the best way to kind of give an analogy to patients that it's basically, you know, a, a, a rusty hinge. And especially with the knee joint, because sometimes we refer to the knee as a hinge joint. Now, arthritis is present in about 70 million of people in the United States. There's multiple types of arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory arthritis. But the bottom line is they all end up in the same thing. That cushion in our knee, that cartilage gets deteriorated. And you saw some of that in some of Dr. Hornstein's pictures and from the surgeries where uh, the, the, the crab meats type stuff, that was kind of the early cartilage damage. And then the places where there are like full thickness defects um, that's the kind of more severe arthritis. So when we talk about patients with knee arthritis, we ask them, you know, how often does your knee hurt? Does it interfere with sleep? Is it difficulty walking any type of distance? Uh, are the conservative measures like medications or injections uh, no longer working? Um, are there things that you don't do because of your knee? Do you not walk on, your, on the boardwalk or, or walk with your spouse in the evening because your knee hurts? Um, and, and the number one reason I think to get a knee replacement is that inactivity from the knee pain actually causes you to gain weight because that can lead to a whole other host of medical issues. So how can we sh treat knee pain or knee arthritis? Uh, well, you can do ice packs or heat packs. You know, I tell people try both and see which one helps you the most. Um, ice is going to serve to decrease inflammation and blood flow and heat is going to serve to increase inflammation or increase blood flow and hopefully increase healing. Uh, medications, anti-inflammatories, Motrin, Aleve, Advil, all of these types of medications can help with pain. Tylenol is another that can help with pain. Uh, steroid uh, packs, like steroid pills, can also help. Uh, injections, uh, I'm sure some of pe the people on this, uh, chat, this Zoom call have had injections, whether it be steroid or cortisone injections, or even the hyaluronic acid injections. One of those brands is Orthobisc, another is Synbisc, there's lots of brands out there. Um, basically, the hyaluronic acid injections serve to decrease inflammation and also increase the lubrication or the production of fluid in the joint. Um, exercise and physical therapy, believe it or not, if you have a bad knee, exercise and physical therapy are actually good for you. Um, number one, they can help with weight loss, which is the, the best way to treat your knee pain is to lose weight. Uh, number two, they can help strengthen the muscles around the joint, which can compensate for pain. And also, when the time comes, make, uh, make you a better candidate for surgery. 
So when we when all these non-operative things fail, whether it's injections, anti-inflammatories, physical therapy, maybe 15 years ago you had that knee arthroscopy with the partial meniscectomy. But when all these things failed and you end up with bone on bone arthritis, which Dr. Hornstein had shown a picture of, the the knee replacement is the option. And it's a great procedure. It's a procedure in which we replace the damaged surfaces with metal and plastic. It helps relieve pain and restore mobility. And it's incredibly common. Uh, this number here, 580,000 knee replacements is probably low at this point. Uh, we're, we're probably getting close to a million every year in, the, in this country. So how does it work? So here's the model of the knee that we looked at first uh, in one of the first slides we had. So the femoral component sits on the femur, the tibial component sits on the tibia, the insert or the plastic piece sits between these two metal components. And then there's also a, often a plastic piece on the underside of the kneecap. You still keep your real kneecap in a knee replacement. So here's what it looks like on an X-ray. So here's a healthy knee right here on, uh, I believe your screen's left, which has uh, the femur, the tibia, and then uh, black space in between. That represents the cartilage. Here's a replaced joint where you have your femur and your tibia. The white is the metal femoral component. The white here is the metal tibial component. And then there's a piece of plastic in between. So it kind of looks analogous to your regular knee. So let me go back here for a second. So, okay, so here's an example right here of a knee that has uh, arthritis throughout the joint. You can see the bones are touching right over here all the way through. So this is a great example for a total knee replacement. Now, if you're one of the few people, probably less than 25% of patients that has arthritis limited to the medial or, or lateral or just the patellofemoral compartment, you could do a partial knee replacement. So in this picture, the arthritis is really limited to this area here that's red. And what we did in this picture was we did a partial knee replacement where there's a piece of metal on the femur and then a piece of plastic on the tibia, yet the rest of the knee is normal and it stays with native cartilage and, and native uh, ligaments. And that hopefully gives people a more um, a natural feel to their knee. And, and you can see right here, here's a picture of the partial knee replacement. So you just remove, remove the damaged portion of the knee and you replace it with a metal and then a plastic piece here. So again, the, a partial knee replacement is a great option for a small percentage of patients. Knee arthritis is best diagnosed with a, an x-ray only. You don't need an MRI or anything like that. And the partial knee replacements can also be uh, diagnosed or indicated on the x-ray as well. Sometimes an MRI can help with the partial knee, making a decision on a partial versus a total knee replacement. Um, a partial knee replacement typically requires a smaller incision with less scarring and potentially uh, faster recovery. So, you know, the leading cause of knee pain as we age is knee osteoarthritis. It's a degenerative condition that'll get worse over time and not better. And early diagnosis and treatment are important for knee replacement. It's important even at a younger age, if you're having knee problems, to get that diagnosis and to understand the things, whether non-surgical or surgical, that can make you feel better and function. And most importantly, do the things that you want to do. Knee replacement's a very successful surgery and... Um, there's a lot of information out there on knee replacement, and I'm sure we'll talk about that with some of the questions. So a lot of the a lot of patients wonder, well, what can I expect after a joint replacement? You know, knee replacement today isn't what your grandmom went through. Um, the hospital stay is shorter. Most people will be in the hospital one night. Many people can even go home the same day. Uh, some of these surgeries are even being done in surgery centers. Uh, the recovery is going to be different. It's going to be faster. There's going to you're going to get therapy nearly right away. Our patients at Capital Health have their surgeries in the morning and typically are walking with physical therapy before lunch. How do we do that? Well, we can do that by taking better care of our patients by controlling their pain and nausea. If you're not having pain and you're not having nausea, chances are you'll be able to do your therapy. So we start with pain medication before, during, and after surgery. We don't just give opioids. We give other medications like anti-inflammatories and nerve medications and even steroids. With nausea, we give medication before, during, and after surgery. And then another way we can control pain is by doing injections in surgery. And also we can have our anesthesiologist do nerve blocks to help with pain. For knee replacement, physical therapy, whether it's partial or full, physical therapy is a huge component. And physical therapy can be you, do a patient doing exercises on their own, um, or it can also mean going to a therapy gym three times a week. 
And returning to work is variable for, for everyone. It depends on your job. If you have a desk job, you could, in theory, go back to work in a very short period of time. If you're a laborer or construction worker, you may need a full, even three to four months to get back to work after a knee replacement. So the best way to prevent a joint replacement is to stay active, have an exercise program, which is start at a young age and do regularly, um, and, and weight control. What we know through longitudinal studies of populations is that those who are even just 10 to 15 pounds heavier in their 20s are three to four times more likely to require a knee replacement in their 50s or 60s. So the weight control is a huge part of treatment of knee osteoarthritis. And it's really simple physics. For every pound you weigh, it's seven pounds of force on the knee, which is simply due to gravity. So even if someone you know, has a bad knee or has some knee pain, and if they lose just 10, 15 pounds, they can make that pain go away uh, without any other treatment sometimes. So really important to stay active with an exercise program and to control your weight, especially as we age, because we know it's harder to lose weight as we get older. That was all I had for you for my portion of the talk. Dr. Hornstein and I are very excited to um, uh, answer and read your questions. And of course, I couldn't give a lecture without giving homage to uh, my alma mater, Penn State. So we are Penn State. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's see. Um, I'm, I don't know if you can see everything. I'm going to read some questions that are on the chat box right now. Um, it looks like it was just sent to me. Um, let's see. All right, does anybody have any questions right now? Yeah, this is Renee. I do have a, a question, well, two questions. My first question was when you were talking about uh, non weight bearing, does that mean not walking at all or does it mean something else? Well, non weight bearing means you're just not putting any weight on the leg. So you can put it down for balance and standing, but when you're ambulating, you use crutches or a walker to not put weight on it. So yeah, that, that uh, I guess you're talking about the osteotomy procedure. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a pretty big procedure to do. It's actually probably a little more onerous to do than a knee replacement, but you are keeping your own joint. So it is an, it is an option for some people. Okay. And I had a second question, but it eludes me. <laughs> I'll keep thinking on it. <clears throat> Thanks. I'll be here. Um, I just want to remind everybody too, um, if you could um, complete the uh, survey at the end of this, um, it's in the chat box. Um, but here's a question for either of you. Stationary bike, safe for the knee in the elderly, anything to watch out for? That's a great question. You know, I always, I'm gonna take that one, Josh. Um, uh, you know, when I see patients with knee arthritis, I always recommend an exercise program. And you know, the conundrum is, well, my knee hurts when I walk or run, so what do I do? And our knee arthritis patients uh, tend to like stationary bikes the most. Uh, recumbent ones are the best. It puts the least amount of force or stress on that arthritic knee. And uh, swimming is another good activity for exercise in our arthritic patients. Uh, and the elliptical is probably a bit of a compromise. So the elliptical is a good one as well. But a stationary bike is great. Um, you, you just want to make sure positionally that you're in a, in a good, comfortable position so you don't strain your back or something like that. And uh, for knee arthritis, the recumbent one's even better. Just to get a vaccine. Um, another question, MSM chondroitin useful. Are exercises for strengthening the knee recommended in the elderly? Yeah, absolutely. Exercises for strengthening, you know, I, uh, I'm a firm believer that, you know, exercise, whether it's strength training, cardio, or even flexibility training are really helpful as we age uh, to keep our bodies young and to prevent injury. Um, Josh, what do you think about that as far as, you know, our athletic or maybe our more athletic patients, however you want to define athletic? I mean, the best way to prevent uh, fractures uh, and keep yourself healthy is, you know, low impact weight bearing exercises. Um, regarding the uh, MSM glucosamine question, that's always been very controversial. I've been in practice for 18 years and I can tell you when I first came out in practice, it was a very popular to give people supplements. Uh, we used to hand it, give handouts in the office and that really has kind of been debunked over the years. And, and we do inject glucosamine and chondroitin. That's what the visco supplementation injections many of you may have had is. 
but as far as orally taking it, it does not really seem to make much of a difference and they are somewhat expensive. Yeah, and Josh, I'll add to that. Um, the, the, the mechanism too, people think that because glucosamine and chondroitin are the building blocks of cartilage that whether these materials are injected into them or they take them orally, that there's a chance that it'll regrow cartilage. That's definitely not happening. We know that. Um, there may be an anti-inflammatory effect with these medications or these compounds, and that's probably what you're getting, uh, but you're certainly not going to regrow cartilage. That's not something that occurs. Right. And I agree that the injections we give, the glucosamine injection we give, I tell people it's kind of like changing the oil in your car. It's going to make the car run a little bit better, but you still have the same engine that you started with. So they're not going to regrow cartilage. That was kind of some of the mis misnomers from the beginning when these first came out. But um, yeah, as far as the injectable glucosamines, they seem to help people. Probably about two thirds of people get benefit orally. I don't. I think it's an uh, expensive uh, placebo effect. Yeah, I see a question from a Keith. Um, if you're a likely knee replacement candidate, how do you select the brand of replacement? Um, if you're a candidate for knee replacement, you don't select the brand, unfortunately. Um, what you really need to do is select your surgeon and then let the surgeon choose the brand that's right for you. Most of the time, the surgeon's going to use one of two implants, which they typically use, and that works pretty well. Um, no study has proven that either brand or any brand or type of knee replacement is better than another. Um, so they all work. Uh, so the best thing to do is to uh, use an implant which your surgeon's most comfortable with. Uh, there's another question from Andrea about joint replacements. Do they get glued to the bones? Uh, the knee replacements most commonly in America are uh, grouted to the bones with a bone cement. Um, they can be press fit though by, you know, basically cutting the bones in such a fashion that the implant uh, just has a very tight fit on the bones. And that's something that's become more common in the last few years. We haven't really figured out that one way is better than the other, but we do know that they both work pretty well. So knee replacements should be expected to last about 85 to 90% of the time for about 20 years, whether it's cemented or not cemented. Okay, I see one here from Armour. Uh, how are PAs using the OR and both shoulder and knees and what tasks do they do specifically? It's a good question. Um, I have a physician assistant, so is Dr. Saxena. They are very helpful in our daily lives and our daily work. Um, I use my physician assistant for knees, for example, for the ACL surgery. Uh, when I have a graft that we have to prepare, he or she prepares the graft for me. They also help with uh, me drilling and while I'm holding, you know, there's multiple tasks um, to do this and there's usually more than one cook needed to do a surgery. So um, I, the PA will help and hold or if we're doing a shoulder surgery, uh, they'll use the hammer while I'm holding the instrument that needs to be hammered. Um, so physician assistants are very, are very key for us in the operating room. I'm sure Dr. Saxena is a joint replacement surgeon, I'm sure can add to that as well. Yeah, absolutely. PAs are really helpful in the operating room. Um, if you ever see a video or, or have a chance to observe, a, a, whether it's an arthroscopic surgery or an open surgery, um, it, it's almost a little bit like a fire drill. We're, there's so many things that have to be done uh, guides that are put on or uh, things placed here and held in, in place so the, the exact right thing occurs. So the PAs are like an extra set of hands that can really help. And, you know, a really experienced PA like uh, Josh's PA, Kyle, or my PA, Rose, um, it can really help with that and make the surgeon's job easier. So we can kind of focus on, uh, on, the, on the smaller, uh, more fine details of the surgery. So it's really helpful to have uh, a consistent PA or assistant around in the OR. Uh, Josh, there, there's a question about someone. Bobby said their knee falls out of alignment at night while they're sleeping. What might be happening and how would it be treated? My knee is also bone on bone. Um, I'll take this one, Josh. I thought it was going to be a sports question, but it sounded more like a replacement question. Um, so if the knee is bone on bone, you, you know, people can sometimes feel unstable and feel like the knee is popping or moving in place. It's probably not actually doing that. It's probably all just uh, symptoms of arthritis. So, and, and very commonly we see that knee arthritis uh, can cause night pain and nighttime symptoms. So Bobby, unfortunately, you're probably just suffering from arthritis. So it's really important to um, work with a physician uh, to try to improve that, whether it be with injections or therapy, or, you know, if you're bone on bone, you're probably eventually going to need a knee replacement. Uh, another joint replacement type question. So if you have a home with multiple staircases, do you need to go to rehab for a period of time with a full knee replacement? 
Uh, the answer to that, from Capital Health's perspective and, and the Rothman Institute's perspective, um, is no, you don't need to go to rehab. Uh, we do the surgery so that you walk the day of surgery with therapy. And then for those patients that have you know, issues at home, like staircases or things like that, or maybe five steps to get into the house, um, we actually have steps that you practice on. And then going up in the hospital and then going up and down steps is actually part of your rehab. So that movement, um, that function is part of your rehab and, and the therapist can work with you to try to figure out how to do it. Um, but no, you can absolutely go up and down staircases after surgery. I encourage my patients to not set up a bed or a room in the, on the first floor. I encourage them to go up uh, even the day after or the day of surgery. Okay, I'll take this one from Kim. I'm sorry, from um, uh, Joe and Michelle. Uh, question about rising up from a squat. What, what would cause pain? That is usually going to be a kneecap or a patellofemoral issue. A uh, very common problem uh, in our population. Um, again, it usually if it's just rising from a squat, we try to have you not squat too deeply. But if that becomes a more persistent problem, there's always treatment with medications or injections that we can do for that. And uh, we got one more here um, from Kim. If you are a 62 year old in pretty good physical shape with a meniscus tear, what are your treatment options? A lot of it depends, uh, Cliff, on your knee. So if you have a lot of arthritis and you have a meniscus tear, usually we will typically treat that conservatively first. If you have just an isolated meniscus tear and the rest of your knee is in pretty good shape, um, that might be a good indication for surgery for an arthroscopy to go clean that meniscus tear out. It really depends what the rest of your knee looks like. So I can't. I, I would say the meniscus tear has to be treated in conjunction with what's what the rest of your knee looks like. I see one from Sarah for general knee pain due to arthritis and misalignment. Is heater ice better? Um, I think you know you really want to try both. They do different things. Heat is going to increase blood flow and hopefully promote healing. Ice is going to decrease blood flow and hopefully decrease inflammation. Um, so I would always recommend the patients just try both and see what makes you feel better. Um, you may like alternating heat versus ice uh, from time to time. Um, I saw another question here about someone whose mom, Peggy's mom is 90 and sedentary but not overweight. She gets the hyaluronic acid shots every six months with a steroid shot in between. She does not want surgery. Um, she cannot keep up with PT due to some dementia issues. Is there another option? Unfortunately, Peggy, no, there isn't a great option for your mom. Um, as we get older, surgeries become uh, more difficult as they're more complicated by medical issues. So a knee replacement in a 90 year old isn't ideal, though it could be done. Um, if she doesn't want surgery, that's absolutely fine and reasonable. She can continue with conservative treatment. Unfortunately, the one thing we do know is that the conservative treatment, the injections, the steroids, the therapy, the anti-inflammatories, they eventually stop working for most people because the arthritis just gets so bad. So um, it's not an ideal situation for your mother, but I can certainly understand that she, you know, she doesn't want a surgery at 90 years old. So she probably just has to keep doing what she's doing. So best of luck to your mom, Peggy. I see a question about Josh, but what about meniscus tears? Do you recommend any type of braces, Josh? Um, I mean, sometimes you can try an over the, off the shelf or over the counter, you know, hinge knee brace or a compression sleeve. Unfortunately, when you have uh, a meniscus tear there, it's like kind of having a pebble in your shoe. And some days it's bothering you a lot and other days it's not. So it's really hard to brace those. Um, and unfortunately, when they're in isolation and, and properly indicated, they're usually a good case for surgery for an arthroscopy. Josh, another question from Andrea about stem cell injections, which I'm sure you get these questions a lot. Do stem cell injections regrow cartilage? And if not, what do they do? Uh, good question. I actually was just doing a, a, um, a journal club last night and they had an article about stem cells. And really they do not regrow cartilage. Um, they probably modulate or change the inflammatory process that's going on in your knee from the arthritis. And by chain, because stem cells are essentially pluripotential cells, they can become anything, but they're not going to grow cartilage. That has not been shown to happen, but they may change how your body reacts in it from an inflammatory standpoint in the knee. Uh, and that may be why they help because the, um, you're, you're trying to uh, get the body to relax. So they're almost on the equivalence of doing the uh, lubricant injections that we do quite often in the knee. And they're certainly a lot more expensive than the lubricant injections. Great. Uh, question about Eliquis, which is a blood thinner and uh, knee replacements uh, from Regina. Um, there is a little bit of danger when we use blood thinners. Um, 
uh, based on which blood thinner it is. So uh, for the most part, after hip and knee replacements, we use aspirin to prevent blood clots. So the theory there is that if the aspirin thins the blood a little bit, you're less likely to get a blood clot. Um, Eliquis is another blood thinner, but it's much more potent. So the concern using Eliquis after surgery is, could you cause like a hematoma or an extra collection of blood um, around the surgical site, which would cause problems with the incision or wound drainage or something like that. That being said, if you have a condition where you need the blood thinner, it just makes things a little higher risk, but it's certainly something that can be done safely. Um, so that's kind of, there's not a whole lot you can do about that if you need the medication for your heart. Um, a little patient vignette from Bob. Uh, Josh, I'll give you a little quiz here. So Bob has been diagnosed with high-grade patellar chondrosis and unilateral primary arthritis. He's not too heavy, but his orthopedic didn't say much other than to use an open sleeve, exercise, Voltaren, and turmeric. Anything else Bob can do in terms of PT or anything else he should do? Um, he feels the right knee when it's very cold and hot, but it does, and it does feel uncomfortable. Sounds like he has some early arthritis, Josh. Yeah, I would probably, in that case, suggest either an anti-inflammatory pill, uh, corticosteroid injection, or if those that haven't worked yet, uh, visco supplementation, which is the gel injections. That's where I would go with that. Yeah, and um, the next question I see is a patient who'd been getting orthovisc injections for seven years, and the last injection went bad and really hurt. Since then, it's been hurting more. Could the injection have done damage by going in the wrong way? Um, MC, uh, probably the injection did not do the damage. It may just be that, you know, it's been seven years and the injections just aren't helping anymore. Um, I have seen situations where maybe, you know, the needle hit the bone when you do an injection, which happens every once in a while. Um, but usually that pain will kind of get better. So it may just be that your arthritis is just getting worse. Um, there's a question about from Dwayne about the difference between a minimally invasive knee replacement and a standard knee replacement. Um, that's a difficult, uh, poorly defined uh, term, minimally invasive, because nobody really knows what that means. Um, but basically what minimally invasive surgery is, it's just a, a way of caring for patients uh, by doing less damage to the soft tissue. So I think in the last 20 years, we've probably, the implants haven't changed that much for knee or hip replacement. What's gotten better is the way we, we care for our patients. So we're more conscious of uh, what we cut, what we grab, uh, in, in surgery, uh, we're more conscious of uh, our instrumentation has allowed us to make smaller incisions. Um, so that's, there's really, at this day and age, I think most people are doing some type of minimally invasive knee replacement, and there's really no clear definition of what that is. Uh, we have one from Bobby. Is Capital Health part of Rothman? No. Uh, Capital Health and Rothman have a partnership where we uh, work together and do a lot of partnership in, especially in the joint replacement world, but with all of our surgeries, we all work together. So Capital Health is a hospital system and we, uh, myself, Dr. Saxena, both work there as operating surgeons. And there, it looks like we have Armour who's a PA on the, on the, the, the lecture here today. So welcome Armour. Um, learning, wanting to know more about being more prepared in the OR for shoulder and knee procedures. There's a lot of great learning materials out there that were not available when uh, Dr. Hortzine or myself were training. Um, if you're really looking for videos, uh, one great site is Vu Medi, uh, which has a lot of technique videos and, and it's pretty technical. I don't really recommend it for patients um, because it gets pretty technical. Um, YouTube also has a lot of videos. Uh, those may be more geared towards patients. That being said, they can be a little graphic, so just be careful on what you'll look at. Um, so that was it for Armour's question. Um, there was a great question from Kathy. Do you recommend certain exercises or there are, are there ones that you do not recommend? You know, what I think with exercise is people can get into fads, right? So they'll start real hot and heavy into let's say CrossFit or yoga and they'll do it for six weeks, but then they realize they just don't like it and then they eventually just stop. So my recommendation for all my patients is do the exercise that you enjoy that you'll continue to do. Um, because the exercise that you do is a lot better than the exercise that you don't. So if you're a bike rider, keep biking. If you're a runner, keep running. Um, it's really important just to exercise and get out there. So, and there's so many barriers to it and so many reasons every day to not exercise that it's important to do what you enjoy. I have one here from Donna. Uh, I had an X knee x-ray due to knee pain. X-rays were performed laying down, not standing. It showed no arthritis. Does it make a difference? And then I went on to have an MRI and showed meniscus tear. So 
in my opinion, I'm sure Dr. Saxena as well, weight-bearing exercise, uh, weight-bearing uh, x-rays are much better. They do will oftentimes show arthritis that a laying down x-ray will not show. The MRI will also sometimes show arthritis, but sometimes even with all the best imaging studies, the arthritis gets, gets, just doesn't show up for whatever reason. So in your case, if your knee MRI didn't show any arthritis, you could always do the standing x-rays and see if you do have some arthritis and you may be a candidate for an arthroscopy for that meniscus tear. Next one's from John um, asking about partial knee replacement. And what's the possibility of needing a full replacement down the road? That's a great question. We do see in partial knee replacements about a 10 to 15% uh, incidence of progression of arthritis in the other parts of the joint. That doesn't necessarily mean those patients need to be converted to a full knee replacement or maybe even get another partial knee replacement, but there is certainly an incidence of that that's fairly low. Um, I see one from Terry about bilateral knee replacement. Is a rehab facility necessary or can the patient go home? Yes, you can absolutely go home after bilateral knee replacement, though I would caution people. It's a pretty difficult procedure to go through, so I usually don't recommend it. So uh, this, this is Renee again. I just, um, my question came back to me. So I, I have this pain on the on the outside of my left knee that I've had for over a year. And I'm, I'm pretty sure it's a meniscus tear. So if I made an appointment over there, do I make an appointment with athletics or with the surgeon? Well, we're all, we're, the, we have surgeons and non-surgeons. So you could certainly start with one of the non-operative doctors and uh, depending on the rest, how the rest of your knee looks, you may not need surgery, but sometimes you do. So we have to really kind of right. work Take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. Thank um, you. And I, this is Maggie. I'm just going to add um, from the Rothman ortho rep. Um, they said that Dr. Saxena sees patients um, out of the Hamilton, Pennington, and Princeton office. And the phone number for patient VIP scheduling is 609-528-3670. Um, and all, another big shameless plug from our end is... Um, that we have an office in Hamilton, New Jersey, which we've been there for a while. Um, we just moved that across the street where the Kmart is in, or used to be in Hamilton at 1079 Whitehorse Mercerville Road. Uh, big Rothman signs that you can see uh, from the road. So it should be easy to find. And we're actually gonna be opening a, a, an orthopedic urgent care uh, this coming Monday, March 15th. Um, they'll have walk-in appointments there from Monday through Friday, eight to five and Saturday, nine to five. And uh, also would be remiss if I didn't uh, plug my, my partner, Dr. Hornstein. He's a sports medicine surgeon and he sees patients out of our board in town, Hamilton and Pennington office. Uh, we'll keep going with the questions. There's a lot of good ones here. Um, a question from Sid about knee replacement and getting MRIs or CT scans or metal detectors. Uh, none of the orthopedic implants at this day and age will preclude a patient from getting an MRI or a CT scan. Um, and metal detectors, yes, a knee or hip replacement can set off a metal detector in the airport. You wanna let your TSA agent know that you have an orthopedic implant uh, before you go through the machines. Uh, the synthetic fluid injections are typically not very painful. Uh, they're pretty similar to any type of cortisone injection um, and they're done very quickly. So uh, they're pretty well tolerated usually. We, and Josh, what we end up injecting during our daily office day, we easily, you know, five to 10 patients get some type of injection a day. So it's a pretty common thing. It's, it's not pleasant, but it's, it's fairly quick and not too painful. And there are different options. Uh, I happen to like a one shot injection. It's a little more fluid volume, but it's only one shot versus three shots. Some other guys like the three shots. There actually is really very little difference between the two, but um, sometimes I, I look at three as more than one, but uh, sometimes the one is a little more painful. Uh, there's a question here from Cliff. Uh, he said that he had a meniscus tear again, uh, no arthritis, and he feels like his knee is coming out of joint sometimes. Sometimes it'll feel like the knee is giving way or the knee is slipping and sliding out of place. Yeah, that can be a meniscus tear. It sounds to me based on your knee and what you're telling me that you probably need an arthroscopy of your knee just because this meniscus tear is causing you pain. You have no arthritis on the X-ray and MRI. I'm sure you've had some non-operative treatment and that would be a good indication for a knee arthroscopy. Cliff, Dr. Kornstein will be in our Hamilton location, our new Hamilton location on Friday if you want to see him, okay? Just going to uh, line, Dr. Uh, next one I see, we talked about bilateral knee replacements. Yeah, I typically don't recommend them at the same time. 
I usually say an interval of two to three months between knee replacements is a good one. Um, we have Steve, he's a 68 year old overweight runner who has difficulty with steps and his knee gets stiff when he sits for any period. Yeah, this sounds like arthritis, Steve. Um, sounds like some PT has helped you. Uh, probably the next step is to use some anti-inflammatories to see if they help you. And then at some point, you probably need to come in and see me at our uh, Hamilton or Pennington or Princeton office to get an x-ray just to assess it and see how bad it is and see what other things can be done to help you. Uh, Another one. I had a partial knee replacement at an outpatient surgery center and went home in a few hours. Is that available? Uh, that is available. Uh, most of my partial knee replacements will go home uh, the same day. Okay, here's one from Nancy. My knee clicks when standing. Would a brace or wrap help with that and the pain? Well, if there is pain, you could sometimes try a brace or medication. If there's no pain with the clicking, usually the clicking sound is mostly your, your um, joints is moving on each other and just like your knuckles crack, your knee, knees will crack. So if it doesn't hurt, I would do nothing about it. If it does hurt, I would probably try a brace or some oral anti-inflammatories and that doesn't work. You can always come in and see us in one of our offices. I think we've, I think we've run out of questions. Yeah, all very good questions. I uh, really want to thank the audience for their attention and thank Maggie and Marsha from Capital Health um, uh, for, for hosting us. This was great. Oh, it looks like we got another one. Josh, you take this one. Okay. Great presentation. Thanks for putting it together. Did I miss the question? What's the question? I don't see it here. I'm sorry. It's uh, Albert. He's got arthritis and a small meniscus tear. He's been doing PT and seen some improvement but sometimes he gets pain in the top backside of his calf. What would that be? That's probably what's called a Baker cyst, which is a very common problem with arthritis and meniscus tear. Uh, it's fluid that builds up in your knee and then it has, somewhere to, it has to have somewhere to go. So sometimes it will go out the back of your knee and actually migrate or travel down the back of your calf and um, cause inflammation in your calf muscle, believe it or not. So that's probably what you have going on. Not a surgical problem, something we try to just watch and, and um, you know, and doctor and, and med help the patient through this process. But it's usually not something we want to operate on. It's something we will sometimes do a cortisone shot for, but usually we'll just try to doctor you through and get you through the, uh, get through the bad parts of it. And we got another one from Laurel. How soon can I do yoga after knee replacement? Um, that depends on what you're doing for yoga. Um, after knee replacement, you can kneel on your knee. Um, the only problem is for the first few months, it's going to be painful because the bottom part of that incision is kind of right on the tibia bone. There isn't too much skin or fat there to kind of protect it. So it may be very irritated by kneeling soon after a knee replacement. So, uh, if you modify your yoga, you could probably get back to that relatively soon in some way, shape or form within two to four weeks. And that can even be part of your rehab. If you're looking to go kind of full on yoga um, with downward dogs or, or sorry, uh, like cobras and things like that, um, that may be a little longer before you can get to that stuff. So I, I think yoga is a great thing to do because it's all about individuality and, and modifying. So you probably just need to modify. Okay, I'll, I'll take this next one from Peggy. My daughter has knee pain. Physical therapy was not successful. She has ligament laxity but her IT band is tight. The kneecap gets off track. What do you suggest? Well, um, sometimes you can try bracing for that. Sometimes you will need surgery for that, but um, if there hasn't been a formal dislocation or a subluxation where the kneecap goes partly out of place, usually you wanna to try to treat that non-operative as long as possible. But uh, these kneecap problems can be really challenging, even though they're extremely common, uh, but we really try to not do surgery if at all possible for those. And it looks like Steve has a question about getting into an elliptical. I'm assuming that's after knee replacement. Um, somewhere in between, you know, that two to six month mark, you know, or two to six week mark uh, with physical therapy, usually my goal is for the therapist to get the patients on an exercise bike. So, you know, just everybody's a little different on when they can get there, but, it, you know, under the guidance of your therapist and your doctor, it's reasonable to get back to it in a relatively short period of time. Um, is stair climbing a good weight bearing exercise for pre preventative purposes? Stair climbing is probably um, the, the exercise that's going to probably cause the most stress on your joints. So I would say as we age or if we're trying to prevent arthritis or knee injuries, stair climbing probably isn't ideal. But if for some strange reason you just love doing that, um, I would say go for it. Um, but it's probably one of the higher impact things you can do to your knees. Um, 
Nancy has one here. Does arthritis cause pain down the leg or pain and pain just sitting? Uh, the answer to both those is yes. It can actually, the pain from the arthritis can radiate right down your tibia or shin bone into your ankle even. And it can actually go all the way up to your hip as well. So that's a very common problem. And, and it can be pain with just sitting as well because your, your knee's not moving. Uh, it's like a car on a cold day where that oil hasn't been heated up yet to get moving around and your knee starts aching. So that's a very common complaint. And Barbara has a question about allergy issues. Um, this is an interesting topic in knee replacement surgery and it's somewhat controversial. If you're someone who has allergy issues and has concerns about metal or implant allergies, we actually have a uh, blood test which you can take um, to help us to understand what you might be allergic to. And that can make us modify what implants or what type of implants uh, would be used in your surgery. That includes the actual metal component or even the cement or grout that we use. Uh, Peggy has a question, follow-up question. Sorry, it's my phone ringing. Um, do, do kneecap issues lead to arthritis? They can. So what happens is kneecap issues are a little different than arthritis itself. It's a similar mechanism. It's called chondromalacia of the patella, basically means bad cartilage of the kneecap. It's very common. It can start in your teens and 20s. And um, we'll call, and, and that can, over time, progress to the rest of the knee going bad as well. But usually it starts out with young females in their teens and 20s and can progress over, over your ages and become in your 50s and 60s. It becomes arthritis. Yes. Uh, another question about kneecap issues leading to arthritis. Um, I, I think, yeah, you know, Josh, maybe you can talk about it um, in your career. When you see those patients in their 30s and 40s with chondromalacia or, you know, small meniscus tears, I think we tend to see those patients maybe 10, 20, 30 years down the road with arthritic changes, don't you? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I've been doing this for 18 years, so I'm still a little young in the game to see as people start coming back, but they do come back with um, with the kneecap cartilage starts out first and then it progresses to the rest of the knee goes bad after that. It's a generally inflammatory environment. So we will sometimes treat those patients with cortisone shots or the, or the lubricant injections to try to stem the tide for them. Um, this is a question I don't have the answer to. Is it better to keep your knees bent or straight while you're sleeping? Uh, I'm not sure what, what happens while your knees hurt while you're sleeping is because they're in the same place all night. And just like I talked about with the lubricants in the knee joint, if a car is not, is on a cold day, the oil is really not moving very well. Same thing with your knee. It's been in the same place for uh, all night. You wake up in the morning, they're usually gonna be very stiff and sore. Uh, for Robin, as far as position of your knees when you sleep, um, whatever works for you. Um, if you woke up with a straight leg and you couldn't bend it, it could indicate an arthritic problem. It could indicate a meniscus problem. So if that's something that keeps happening, you probably need an evaluation, Robin. Uh, Thomas, can arthritis right in the hip cause knee pain? You know, that's one thing I didn't mention because I was focused on the knee and, and not the hip and the knee in this talk. But yeah, it's interesting. Um, there's something called referred pain in medicine where you have a problem in one place, but it refers the pain to another. A perfect example is the spine where you might have a problem of pinched nerve in your lumbar spine, but you have numbness in your toe or something like that. Well, similarly with hips and knees, you can have bad hip arthritis that actually manifests itself as knee pain. So I've had people come to the office, say my knee's been bothering me. It's really frustrating. They can, and you know, we get a knee x-ray and the knee's fine. And I'll say, well, look, will you just humor me? And after I examine them and I already know it's hip arthritis, I'll say, will you humor me and just get a hip x-ray? And then you see bone on bone hip arthritis. And uh, it's kind of a shock that, you know, you have knee pain, but it's really a hip problem. But yeah, we see that all the time. Okay. I think uh, Maggie, somebody's, Carol's looking yeah. for that. It's uh, at the very beginning of the chat box. Um, there was a link at Survey Monkey. If you can't find it, I can repost it. Uh, yeah, Maggie, maybe repost it so then they don't have to scroll all the way. Back. Okay. Well, Sounds good. Question right here uh, What is the recovery period for and success with arthroscopy and a meniscus tear? Um, that's a good question. Um, it is very variable. The typical recovery after an arthroscopy is about four to eight weeks. That doesn't mean you're in bed for four to eight weeks, it just means before you can go do what you want. Um, a lot of that has to do with how much arthritis you have. So if it's, a, I have a pristine knee except for meniscus tear, that is as close to 100% success as I can get as a, as a human being and a surgeon. Um, but it really takes about four to six weeks for somebody to get there. And usually by that point, I'll say, go back on your bike. You can probably start doing some running in about six weeks. If there's arthritis, 
then we want to go a little slower because we don't want that person to get a flare up with their arthritis in the post-operative period. So um, that's that's my general answer as far as general recovery after meniscus surgery. Great. These have been some great questions. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming and listening and asking your questions. Uh, I think when other people ask questions, you know, the, the people who hear the answers also can learn. So that's great. Um, I want to thank Maggie and, uh, and Marsha Rudolph and their team for setting this up and also our marketing team uh, led by Leslie Gilman in, in this Mercer County area. Um, this is, you know, Capital Health and Rothman really work together because really two like-minded organizations. Um, a lot of patient education opportunities at Capital Health and as well on the Rothman Institute website. Um, so please uh, take a look at those and, and see, you know, if there's other conditions or things you want to learn about. Uh, you certainly can. And I want to thank my partner and friend, Josh Hornstein, for a great lecture. Um, and thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you all. Thanks for participating. Thank you, Marcia and Maggie. Bye-bye. Great. -bye.